Καλησπέρα. I have to start by telling you that being here in this incredible country tonight is the closing of a circle for me, a kind of Ulyssian return to Ithaca. It's as if the theme for this event, No Man is an Island, this place, its timing in my life, all came together to make space for me to share with you a story, a story that has become my road to the understanding of a great truth. So I ask you to come along with me as I try to bring the story to life. The story starts with two people that set up on an odyssey decades ago. They came from simple beginnings, humble by life's hardships, without accomplishments or accolades to their name. And yet, they found the courage to set upon an epic journey. To understand the magnitude of that decision, you need to know three things. One, they were Greek. Their family was their universe. For them, a life away from those they came from could not be imagined without it being seen as an exile of sorts, not just by them, but by all those around them. And two, they had never before crossed the borders of their homeland. They had no idea what they would find on the other end. This foreign land was like the other side of the world for them. And three, they came without knowing the language. They had no home or job waiting for them. And they had only the equivalent of $200 in their pocket. But they dared to dream what to them was the impossible, that somehow, despite a start in their life devastated by the Second World War, followed by unimaginable lack and political oppression, they would find a way to carve a better future for the children they would one day have. And so with this dream, they started off on a wintry March day in 1960 on a ship called Frideriki for the eastern shores of Canada. They could only take with them the most essential of their belongings, and they chose among them a few faded photographs and a collection of LPs with songs about pain and triumph, the broken hearts of parents left behind, and courage to take a road with an unknown end. Legendary songs known as Tragudia Tis Mavris Xenitias, songs of the black exile. And they held on to those few things for dear life, as if they were the thread that was to lead them back out of this labyrinth, because they feared that they would forget where they came from and where they longed to return. And through this decision to stand alone, to disconnect from all those closest to them and from their country, something extraordinary happened. It's as if their heritage intensified. They took their, their ethos, their values, their, their uh, traditions, and put them all in a safe under lock and key to protect and preserve them for their children yet to come. These two people were my parents. This journey was the binding thread woven in the, in the fabric of my life as the child of the diaspora years later when I was born in Toronto. It became the defining element that shaped my sense of who I was and how I was to live my life for years to come. For as long as I can remember, standing as an island, far from the choices of my peers, was a consequence of the vow that I had to accept. In my preschool years, I was raised by my grandmother. When, in a country when children were sent to daycare, she came from Greece just in time for my birth, so that I would be growing up at home speaking Greek while my parents worked, and also in the manner expected of a proper Greek young girl. This was wonderful. I adored her. But it also meant that I had no friends. I spoke no English, and I was far removed from the experience of a young, Greek, of a young child raised in Toronto. And at the age of five, after years in this foreign country, my parents decided to return home. Too much time had passed since that epic journey. The roots that they had unearthed all those years ago could no longer find a way to thrive on Greek soil. And so, 
I found myself a foreigner again, except this time in my own country of birth. All that had been locked in that safe and preserved for all those years for their children had been deeply ingrained in me. I had been fully immersed in the Greek culture, which now made me an outcast as I tried to fit in and, and find a way to adapt to this new world. I remember the shock that I experienced in my first year. Despite my effort to belong and my achievements as a student, I remained an outsider, lacking the life skills of my far more streetwise classmates. I want to give you an example of that innocence with the story of Effie, the precocious little girl that I called my best friend that first year, as she came running up to me to announce, I have great news. I'm the best student in the class, and you are number two. Excited, I ran all the way home to tell my mother. Mommy, I said, I've got great news. Effie's the best student in the class, and I'm number two. My mother looked at me with a suspicious smile and said, Bravo, Basulamu, but tell me, did the teacher tell you this? No, Mommy, I said, Effie did. Surprised that to my mother, Effie's word was not as reliable. And at the age of nine, we returned to Toronto. I found myself an outcast, having now become Greek, faithfully sticking to my vow to justify their sacrifice and to somehow uh, excel in order to fulfill their mission in their life. I found that I, I would take myself out of class every day and into ESL to learn how to speak English. And at the end of that year, the defining challenge came. My call to action. It was time for the public speaking competition for all the grade schools in our district. And of course, my parents said, you can do it. And there I was, hardly comfortable with this new language, signing up. I had an accent. I looked indisputably out of place. And somehow, I won. So by my count, this score on the repayment of the debt that I felt to them was looking rather good. But it was too early for accounting, and I was only nine. At the age of 19, not yet having finished my second year of undergrad studies in economics, I took an entrance exam for early acceptance into law school. Here, too, I stood alone. All my friends were finishing their bachelor's degrees living for the weekend. I felt a sense of urgency. I need to get there and get there via the shortest route, regardless of that, what that would take. So this route saw me practicing as a lawyer at 24, in courtrooms against opponents twice my age, becoming a partner at the firm at 26, teaching law, having the dream home, driving the dream car, and let me not forget the Chanel suits and Jimmy Choo shoes delivered to my office. Finally, debt repaid, I had thought. But as a wise man once said, one birth is given to you by your parents. The other birth is waiting. It has to be given to you by yourself. I didn't know that then, but I was far from giving birth to myself. And at the age of 35, that which no one expected happened. The door to my neatly organized life opened just a crack. And before my logic had a chance to close it shut, I slid through, heart first. I accepted an invitation to join one of my clients in taking a startup, film company public. Let me tell you, shock waves erupted around me. No one understood this decision. It was to be a temporary sabbatical, I would argue. But as time would prove, this was to be the beginning of a pivotal shift in my life. Like Joseph Campbell's hero, entering the stage of the mythic journey where tests, enemies, and allies await, I left what he calls the ordinary world, my stable and organized life, and dove headfirst into chaos. I was placed at the helm of a company as the polished veneer to a core team with one objective, that of gain at all costs. And just as in the mythologist Joseph Campbell's journey, there were tests, onerous tests, 
to my ethics, my, ses- my sense of justice. And there were enemies, those that placed me in this role without realizing where I stood on the issue of ethics. And when they found out, they sent me far, while still maintaining the benefit of my reputation at the helm of the ship. And by far, I mean Warzazat, a place I could not pronounce, in the middle of the desert of Morocco. There I arrived in my silk suit and heels in the middle of the sand dunes. In my mind, I had imagined some air-conditioned Moroccan boardroom waiting for me, a stack of files to review, perhaps a pair of binoculars with which to look out onto the film set from a distance, make my assessment, and return four days later. What I found was a very different reality. But in this desert, I also found the ally, Joseph Campbell's magician, a young man with an old soul and a mystical nature. He had been hired to direct the first three films that were to launch this company on the public market. He and I shared two things, unwavering ethics and the secret that we had uncovered about all the corruption behind the scenes. This formed a deep bond, and together we hurdled the tests like two novices riding the waves in whitewater rafting. With film funds derailed and wire transfers to pay the crew stopped, we found ourselves in the middle of the desert left to manage a film crew of 150 people. My four days in the desert became four months before we were able to return back home. This man was filmmaker and photographer Jakob de Boer. And at the end of two years of battle through this experience together, I found myself displaced once again. My law career, with all its layers of security and achievement, seemed distant, somehow insignificant now. My parents stood in opposition of all the decisions I had made for the first time. The way forward was dim, unclear. My life no longer fit into that neat little box that once enclosed it. And perhaps most significantly, somewhere down this road, I replaced the debt that I felt I had to my parents for another, that to myself. A new imperative slowly started finding its way into my being, the need to follow the path that the small voice inside was paving. And so I did. I went there, to that quiet place inside. And from there, I found the strength to make the most difficult decision of my life. To let go of the crutches of my perceived belonging and connection that I had worked so hard to build, one by one. The mask of the successful lawyer, that of the warrior, the attachment to my mind as the center of who I thought I was, my mission to fulfill my parents' life. And as it had been for them decades before me, this startling choice to stand alone was not easy, but it led to a life beyond my expectations, the life of the witness rather than that of the driver. And from there, the biggest surprise came next. From this place of seeming disconnection, from everything that previously defined me, I connected to the world. My life went from being contained in a glass office on the 20th floor of some Bay Street tower to having boundaries that were unknown. My goals became limitless as a result of being finally free of strict definition. Every day became a celebration, not because it was extraordinary, but because I had found the eyes with which to see the magic in its flaws. And the magician became my partner, and later my husband, and together we embarked on a life journey, a search to capture these glimpses of connection of each of us to the other and to all of existence. This journey has taken us around the globe, as you will see in a small selection of Jakob's photographs that I have brought here. It started with a search for masters in various disciplines around the world, and then went on from there to uh, photograph pristine places where the veil between this world and the next remains thin, 
and where the connection we all talk about is palpable. And most recently, on a new epic journey, to photograph sacred places around the world where our ancestors lived many generations before us, to feel the vibrations in, their, in the landscapes, to understand who they were and where we have come from. And so I ask myself, how did this little girl get here from a life path so well defined for her, as if predestined? What was the power that fueled that shift? And then I remind myself of all those times when either by choice or by necessity, I stood alone. I anchored myself within. I dared to be an island far from the shores of the masses. It was those moments that paved the way to my understanding that every man must be an island before he can experience this truth of the connection of each of us to all of existence. This truth is not something to be discovered outside of us. It is something deep within to be realized. And so to this day, I borrow from the words of a great master and I whisper to myself, stand up, stand apart and let the world echo in your heart. My hope is for this story to be a whisper to the people of Greece in this dark hour, calling to them, Elina, sta sou perifanos, diachorise ton eaftos sou ap ti maza. Gine o idios ton isitis diaforas. Gine o eaftos sou, ke agalia se to sipan. Ευχαριστώ πολύ.